Hello everyone. My name is Oscar and uh, I'm part of the event team within FUF that has organized the event of this evening. Uh, I want to welcome you all and I'm confident that you will find this lecture most interesting and learning. Uh, but before we start, I'll just give you a uh, short background of the event, a presentation of our speaker, as well as uh, some basic te technical info. So, uh, democracy has in many ways been put to the test during the pandemic. Over the past year, due to, to COVID-19, social, political and economic inequalities have been highlighted around the world and the survival of democracy has in some countries been called into question. This raises some important questions. How has access to media in totalitarian countries and the spread of information about the outside world's handling of COVID-19 been affected? By what methods and what motives uh, have the restrictions been applied by the regimes? Has the pandemic been used as a reason for increased use of force against the population? Based on these questions, we at FUF have invited uh, you to uh, a discussion with Paulina Kolvani, an associate researcher at the Varieties of Democracy Institute based at the Department of Political Science at the University of Gothenburg. Paulina holds a master's in political science from the University of Gothenburg and a bachelor in political science and international relations, also a uh, bis and business administration from the American University in Bulgaria. Uh, her research interests include democratization, autocratization, and the quality of gov government. Prior to, your, to joining the Varieties of Democracy Institute, she worked in consulting and volunteered for the European Youth Parliament. Palina is uh, also one of the researchers working on the pandemic backsliding project, which uh, is called Pandem. Uh, the Pandem project assesses the extent to which governments are violating democratic standards for emergency provisions in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Palina, we are very pleased to have you here uh, with us this evening. And before I give uh, you the word, I'll just give the audience some technical info. Uh, please remain muted during the lecture. And if you have questions, you're most welcome to write them in the chat and we will bring them up at the end of this session. With that said, I give the word to you, Paulina. Welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, presentation and also for inviting me. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, present Vidam's work today. So let me just share my screen. Uh, I was also having some issues with the sound, so just let me know if my internet doesn't work very well. Okay, I hope you can see it well. Right, perfect. Yes, so uh, today is Oscar said, um, uh, I will uh, present on the topic of oppression with the pandemic as an excuse. And I work at the Vidam Institute at the University of uh, Gothenburg. Uh, so uh, first of all, I will introduce the topic uh, by talking uh, about our findings from the Democracy Report 2021. So this will highlight the importance of the topic and uh, why it's particularly relevant to talk about autocracies. Uh, then I will talk about pandemic backsliding or the pandem project that uh, I primarily work within. I will present some uh, overall uh, findings and also um, focus on autocracies particularly. And then there will be opportunities for questions and answers, of course. Uh, so yes, uh, our uh, the report, uh, um, Democracy Report this year is titled Autocratization Turns Viral. Uh, and this is an annual publication uh, from the Vidam Institute, which is uh, the world's largest uh, project collecting data on democracy. Uh, and we work with more than 3,500 country experts uh, who fill in survey and then we aggregate the data and produce this report. Uh, 
uh, and basically it shows the state of democracy both uh, in the previous year, so this would be the year of the pandemic, but also the time trend. And this year, uh, the findings are not uh, very optimistic, perhaps. Uh, here you can see a graph uh, that uh, shows the liberal democracy index, which is the main index that we use to measure democracy. And it's both the global average and the uh, averages by each region. Here on the uh, left side, uh, these are uh, averages uh, based on countries. And on the right side, this is a population adjusted measure that takes into account how many people live in each country. And uh, if you look on, on the left, you can see that um, you can see that democracy has, was increasing from around 1974, uh, which is known as the third wave of democratization. However, in recent years, there's been a gradual line uh, in democracy, uh, and we're now in the third wave of autocratization or a decline in democratic qualities. Uh, and this is represented by the black thick line, uh, which has the gray area around it. Uh, and these are the confidence intervals to estimate uncertainty. Uh, and also we see that um, the, the decline uh, affected in particular Asia, Pacifica, uh, Central Asia, Eastern Europe and Latin America regions. If we look on the right side, uh, which is the same graph, but it takes population size into account. We see that the decline in the same uh, black thick line is much larger. And what this shows is that uh, decline in democracy or autocratization affects primarily countries with big populations, such as, for instance, the United States, India, Brazil, and Turkey. Uh, and um, if we, so this graph would show sort of the democratic rights enjoyed by the average global citizen and the citizen of each region. And we can see that uh, this level of democracy for the average global citizen now in 2020 is similar to the levels found around 1990. Uh, so before I show you the next graph, I thought it's important to share how VDEM defines uh, autocracy and democracy, since especially because we spoke, speak about autocracies today. And uh, it's based on the uh, definition of democracy as polyarchy and um, the regimes of the world uh, classification defines four regime types, closed and electoral autocracies and electoral and liberal democracies. And here the difference between um, closed and electoral autocracy is that closed autocracies uh, do not hold multi-party elections for the chief executive or the legislature, while electoral autocracies do hold elections, but these elections are not de facto multi uh, multi-party or free and fair. So this is uh, what, uh, according to this classification, uh, differentiates autocracies from this. So keeping this in mind, uh, here is a similar version of the graph that I showed you previously, uh, which uh, shows uh, the uh, picture uh, with regard to regime type. And here again, on the left, we have the number of countries uh, for each regime type, and on the right, the share of world population in percentage. Uh, and what we see here is that although the world is still more democratic than it was in the, let's say, 1970s and 1980s, the number of autocracies has been increasing, while the number of democracies, especially liberal democracies, has been decreasing. Uh, we do see a drop uh, in close autocracies, so these are countries that do not hold elections, such as, for instance, um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, at the same time, electoral autocracies are becoming more and more common, and their share has almost doubled uh, since 1972. So when we are talking today about uh, pandemic violations in autocracies, this affects a lot of people. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, if we look at uh, on the right side of the graph, we see that 43% of the world population lives in electoral autocracies. And together with closed autocracies, uh, they together are home to 68% of the world population. So this is the majority of people in the world are living in autocracies. Uh, this is also another graph showing a bit of a concerning picture. Uh, and this 
um, displays the situation with regard to autocratization and democratization. So these are declines uh, and increases in democracy, respectively. And here again, you can see on the uh, left the third wave of democratization and then the third wave of autocratization. And um, the third wave of autocratization has been on particular, particular has been increasing since 2010. Uh, you see a sharp increase uh, on both graphs. And um, now in 2020, there are 25 countries undergoing autocratization. And these countries are home to 34% of the world population or 2.6 billion people. So this is uh, affecting uh, many countries and uh, many people. This is just a summary of the previous graphs, uh, basically showing the picture regarding the share of the popul world population that lives in autocracies, which uh, increased from 48% in 2010 to 68% in 2020. And uh, the share of the world living in autocratizing countries has increased a lot from 6% in 2010 to 34% in 2020. And this is compared to 4% uh, of the world population that live in democratizing countries in 2020. So this is really a very, very concerning trend. Uh, now, with this in mind, um, I will introduce the pandemic backsliding project, uh, which uh, tracks state responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in 144 countries. And uh, the initial and overall motivation for this project uh, when it started, we saw that uh, there are some world leaders that claim that um, protecting lives is the key priority and perhaps uh, international norms and human rights can be sacrificed in order to deal with the pandemic efficiently. So here there are uh, two quotes uh, from Hungary and the Philippines, and um, they basically uh, communicate that we need to leave the comfort zone and we need to prioritize life in this kind of crisis. And uh, in Hungary in particular, uh, Hungary went into a state of emergency when the pandemic started, which gave the executive the right to rule by decree on many issues. So the role of the parliament has been significantly limited there. And uh, also the state of emergency back then uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, it didn't have an end limit. So it was declared indefinitely, giving uh, huge powers to the executive. And in the Philippines, uh, uh, the president basically authorized uh, the police to use lethal force to against people who don't comply with the restrictions. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, the motivation of the project uh, is to track uh, how, COVID, uh, how governments uh, violate democratic standards during the COVID-19 crisis, their emergency response. Uh, also to identify which countries are most at risk of democratic backsliding and examine how violations of democratic standards relate to public health outcomes. And the overall um, thinking for the project is based on international human rights law. Uh, so here is a quote from the UN that was issued um, at the start of the pandemic last year, uh, which said that uh, although countries can implement emergency measures to deal with the crisis, for instance, limit the freedom of movement, uh, emergency responses must be proportionate, necessary, and non-discriminatory. And they should also have a clear time limit and not be implemented in an excessive way. Uh, so based on... Um, such human rights law and other theories, uh, we've developed a framework for types of uh, violations of democratic standards that are broadly separated into illiberal and authoritarian practices. Uh, illiberal practices are practices that uh, violate human rights uh, by infringing on autonomy and dignity. And these include discriminatory measures. So these are measures that disproportionately target um, certain groups for example, based on uh, sex, their language uh, and religion. And um, this could include, for instance, quarantines of certain groups that are not based on public health uh, reasons. Uh, the second violation is derogation of non-derogable rights. Uh, 
and this is based on ICCPR or International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights. And um, these are rights that cannot be violated uh, even in an emergency, such as, for example, the right to life, freedom from torture, uh, freedom of religion, and so on. Uh, the third violation is abusive enforcement. So this is uh, this would be measures that use excessive force to implement emergency measures, for instance, by the police. Uh, the second uh, broad category is authoritarian practices, and these are practices that sabotage accountability by limiting um, the citizens' voice and um, and access to information. And these are measures that don't have a time limit. So that are declared indefinitely. Uh, limitations on the legislature where uh, the parliament's role is significantly decreased or they're perhaps even uh, dissolved or uh, the meetings in parliament are postponed. And the sixth one is official disinformation campaigns. So these are uh, campaigns uh, coming from the government that disseminate false information on the nature of the COVID-19 crisis. And the last type is restrictions on the media, and um, this uh, violation basically fits into the to, in both categories. And this could be restrictions on the reporting on COVID-19, uh, limitations on access uh, to information, or physical and verbal harassment of journalists. And uh, we collected data uh, for 144 countries with regard to these types of violations, and then we constructed an index. Uh, that uh, basically um, shows uh, how much countries have violated international norms during the pandemic. And overall, our main findings are that most democracies acted responsibly, although there are several cases with uh, quite severe violations, and uh, 65 autocracies engaged in major or moderate violations of international norms in response to the pandemic. So the majority of countries with uh, serious cases of violations were already autocratic before the pandemic began. And this is a map uh, also for basically all the countries, which shows uh, the pandemic index, pandemic democratic violations index from uh, March to December 2020. So um, this covers uh, the last year so far. And here we have uh, four categories of violations. Uh, in bright green, you can see countries that committed no violations. And these are uh, 14 countries, uh, 13 of which are democracies. So there is only one autocracy with no violations. Uh, in, uh, in green, we see countries with minor violations. So this could be, for instance, isolated cases of uh, limits to access to information. And here we have 35 countries. Uh, in blue are countries with some violations, and in purple are countries with major violations. So these are cases with uh, countries that have um, violated uh, international norms quite a lot. And in these two categories, autocracies are in the majority. Uh, so there are in total 63 countries that committed have committed minor, uh, not minor, some violations, uh, and 43 of these are autocracies and uh, 32 countries have committed major violations, out of which 22 are autocracies. And this is uh, another way to look at the data divided by all types. So this is, again, for all countries, both democracies and autocracies. And what we see here is that uh, the most common type has been restrictions on the media. Uh, the, the last uh, row here where uh, more than half of all countries in the world have committed major violations. Uh, now turning uh, to the autocracies, uh, here is a graph that shows um, that autocracies have violated international norms more than democracies, similar to what we discussed before. And here on the uh, y-axis, uh, you see the pandemic uh, violations index where lower values mean more violations. And on the x-axis is the liberal democracy index in 2020. And this is divided by regime types, where countries in red are autocracies and countries in blue are democracies. And what you see here is that uh, autocracies have violated international norms more. And cases like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, for instance, are 
among the worst violators. But it is important to mention that some democracies like Sri Lanka and El Salvador have committed uh, serious violations as well. Uh, this is uh, another graph uh, that shows, uh, compares autocracies to democracies in their violations of international norms. And this graph uh, shows also the, how the situation evolved over time. So we have uh, collected data for uh, three quarters of 2020, starting in March. So the first row here shows um, the division of countries by uh, basically how, many, how much violations they've committed if from March to June. Then from July to September in the third quarter, and from October to December in the fourth quarter. And then the overall um, index from March to December basically captures all violations committed during the pandemic. And what's interesting to see here is that first, as we discussed before, countries with no violations are predominantly democracies. Uh, and moreover, autocracies have committed much more of serious violations. So in this graph, these are some major violations and democracies. So we have uh, 64 countries with um, some or major violations that are autocracies and only um, 30 democracies that have committed um, some or major violations. Uh, this is another graph showing uh, violations in autocracies for the whole period from March to December, and this again separated into the same categories. So what we can see with regard to type one uh, discriminatory measures is, the, is that uh, most autocracies have committed no violations here, and uh, there are several cases of major violations. And this includes, for instance, um, treatment of migrants that was discriminatory, for instance, in Saudi Arabia and Qatar where migrants were deported, not uh, based on public health reasons. And they were also held in uh, detention centers with unsanitary and inhumane conditions. Uh, this would also include Serbia that has uh, placed uh, migrants and refugees in quarantines without, uh, yeah, basically confining them without access um, ability to go out. Uh, the second type is derogation of non-derogable rights. And here we have seven autocracies uh, that have committed major violations. And this include, for example, Venezuela, where uh, thousands of people have been returning uh, from other countries there. And they were placed in containment centers where conditions were horrible, uh, very unsanitary. And um, there were cases of babies dying from dehydration and also people who were subjected to medical treatment from COVID-19, although they had no, um, sorry, they had no um, symptoms. Uh, the third type is abusive enforcement. So this is uh, cases of uh, police violence. Uh, and here we have quite a few countries that have committed some major violations. And the worst cases here include uh, police uh, killing, uh, shooting people for not complying with emergency measures, for example, in Uganda and Kenya. And um, in Uganda, at least 12 people were killed for not complying with the measures. And in Kenya, at least 21 people. Uh, sometimes these were things like not wearing a mask. And uh, in Kenya in particular, a teenager was killed uh, when he was standing on a balcony uh, within the first few minutes when the curfew was enforced. So this is really horrible and um, very, uh, very violent. The fourth types is no time limit. And here we have uh, 22 countries with some violations. So this would be emergency measures that are enforced indefinitely without a clear end date. Uh, the fifth type is limitations on the legislature, where the lawmaking power of the parliament was restricted. And some parliaments were even suspended or postponed, such as, for instance, in Zambia and Somalia, where for a couple of months, the parliament was not meeting because of COVID. Uh, the sixth type is official disinformation campaigns. So these are cases where uh, government governments have um, disseminated information that contradicts the World Health Organization. And quite some extreme cases include Turkmenistan, which has not acknowledged uh, 
the presence of COVID-19. It claims it has no cases, but uh, it uh, issued um, emergency measures that force people to wear masks because of some dust coming from China. So this is quite extreme. And another case is Tanzania, where the late president promoted herbal medicine to treat COVID and also uh, downplay the dangers of COVID. Uh, but the situation is changing now and they're taking uh, more serious measures. And the seventh type is restrictions on media freedom. And here we can see that this has been by far the most common committed violation with 68 countries that committed uh, major violations. And this would include, for instance, arrest of journalists uh, who are reporting on COVID and so on. And since we're talking about autocracies, in some cases, these countries already have a very low level of media freedom. So it has uh, basically gotten worse during the pandemic in many cases. Uh, this graph shows the situation in autocracies over time. And here we have the number of countries and the three quarters. And we see again that um, the restrictions on media freedom has been by far the most common and it has uh, decreased a bit over time, but not very much. So it went from 68 countries in March to June to 61 countries from in July and September and in October and December. Uh, what we also see is that for most other violations, uh, there's been a slight decrease as well. Uh, except for uh, no time limit. So here we see uh, in the dark blue line that uh, the number of countries with no time limit on the emergency measures has actually increased. And uh, what we also see is that official disinformation campaigns increased if in July and September compared to March and June, going from nine, to nine countries to 19 and then 18 in October and December. So uh, I'm almost done. I just want to say that uh, this data is available online for anyone for free. And uh, you can explore it uh, using dashboard on our website. Uh, all the data and documentation is also available on GitHub using this source. And there is basically all the sources, uh, all the comments for all countries. So you're very welcome to explore it. And we've also published a couple of policy briefs. and. A working paper exploring the data that you can also check out if you're interested. So yes, thank you very much. Um, let me just stop sharing. Yes, I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Valina. It was really interesting and it's good to spread this information about what's happening in the world besides the pandemic. So thank you. Um, someone said if you could maybe post the links in the chat. Definitely. Yes, you should see it now. Yeah. So now we were thinking about opening the floor for some questions, if someone has some. Otherwise, me and the group have arrange some questions by ourselves that we are interested in. Sounds great. Okay, so then I will start with the first question. Uh, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has affected international peace efforts? Yeah, that's a very good question and uh, of course, we've seen a lot of restrictions on movements that um, yeah, limit the ability basically to uh, conduct missions. But also it has been a very challenging crisis and uh, a bit of focus on what happening, what's happening inside the countries themselves rather than yeah, trying to um, help others. So I think that uh, a lot of uh, people have been uh, suffering more because of this and uh, situations of war or um, other issues have been have gotten worse, definitely. We don't track this in the project uh, in particular, but I can imagine that it got much worse. Yeah, 
And that's sad because it's um, like a step back in the process of equality and making a good world for everyone. Um, yes. The next question is, uh, were the potential consequences seen from a long perspective of anti-democratic efforts to handle the pandemic? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we've been wondering as well. And what we see so far is that despite all these violations that I was talking about, uh, the effects of the pandemic on democracy so far have been very limited. So when I was talking about the overall situation in the very beginning, uh, we saw that there was no big decrease in democracy in global levels and regional levels from 2019 to 2020. And this, uh, yeah, basically looking at the data, we only see that the indicators for freedom of movement have been affected, which can be expected, but overall, uh, the effect on democracy so far has been limited. Uh, what is worrying is that a lot of countries have measures without time limit, or at least had them in December when we looked at this. Uh, so the long-term consequences can be uh, quite devastating, especially if such measures are not eliminated as soon as the pandemic ends. So it still remains to be seen. Thank you for answering. Uh, I just want to see, uh, say that if anyone wants to make a question, just uh, write in the chat uh, if you're too shy to talk or don't or can't talk uh, because you're in an environment that doesn't allow you. Um, uh, the next question are, why the potential consequences of children being unable to attend their school as a result from governmental restrictions? Yeah, these are definitely very challenging and important questions. And uh, what we know is that education is very important for democracy. It's very important for uh, maintaining democracy and developing values. So this could have uh, quite long-term effects and this would remain to be seen, I guess, uh, in many years to come. So uh, yeah, it's been definitely challenging in many, many ways. Definitely. Um... And do you see any violations of human rights as a consequence of the restriction, not only in totalitarian regimes, but also in democratic states such as Sweden? Well, uh, based on our data, uh, we don't see uh, major violations in Sweden, as you saw on the map, uh, but uh, we do have several cases of so democracies that have committed quite severe violations of international norms. So this includes, as I said, for instance, Sri Lanka and, and El Salvador. In El Salvador, the emergency response has been uh, quite um, severe in terms of abusive enforcement. So there's been a lot of uh, violence in enforcing the measures. We've also seen uh, discrimination, for instance, in Sri Lanka and in other democracies, uh, including Greece. So uh, it is quite unfortunate that um, yeah, it's uh, uh, many countries that are committing violations and uh, especially with regard to uh, media freedom as we saw. So the media freedom is by far the most common one and yeah, it remains to be seen how this would affect uh, both democratic and autocratic countries. And just of curiosity, why do you think that it's just media freedom that is most violated? And do you have any like answer to the cause behind it? Mm, well, uh, if we look at how democracy is eroded over the past 10 years, we also see a pattern that uh, freedom of expression is under attack a lot. Uh, so this is uh, an area of democracy that um, suffers during autocratization and we see the same situation during the pandemic and of course access to information in a crisis is particularly important if you know if journalists don't have access to hospitals and cannot 
uh, talk about the situation or there is not enough access to information for people. This can have severe consequences and um, can be very problematic. But unfortunately, this is um, could be quite easy to restrict, I guess, especially if it's things like restricting journalists' freedom of movement during a state of emergency or, or yeah, uh, what we've seen is that some countries have enacted new laws uh, restricting freedom of information, for instance, uh, criminalizing false information. So these are laws that are quite broad uh, and yeah, can be used both during the pandemic and later on. Yeah. Um, has the pandemic made the spread of this information more effective? And, and if so, in what ways? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, we've seen, um, I guess, um, people are staying at home more and using social media more. But um, if we look at our data, we see um, disinformation campaigns by the government in many countries. Uh, perhaps a well-known example is uh, former President Trump in the US. And uh, this, of course, when it's coming from the government, it's particularly problematic and can fuel the spread of disinformation overall and yeah, undermine efforts to fight the crisis. Uh, as I said, there are some countries with very extreme examples promoting medicines that were not proven to work. Uh, I myself, I'm from Belarus and yeah, there's been a lot of uh, news with things like uh, you know, going to the sauna <laughs> to treat COVID and so on. And this can definitely um, decrease trust in the government's ability to fight the pandemic, but also spread this information and uh, make people not realize the dangers of the virus. Uh, one question from me. It, it has less to do with the pandemic and more to do with uh, the, the threshold between autocrats autocratization and democracy. I saw that VDEM no longer considers India a democracy. Um, and the stats that you showed in the beginning of the presentation or like in the midst of the presentation showed that about 34% of the world's population live in autocratic regimes. Did that take India into account or was it prior to VDEM's, uh, yeah, VDEM's establishment of their autocratization? Yeah, you're you're right. Uh, so this year we have we've seen that India is no longer a democracy. It's now classified as an electoral autocracy. And in the graphs that I showed, I can share them again, perhaps if necessary. But there is basically a huge jump in the um, in the share of the world population living in autocracies because of that. Because obviously India was the world's large largest democracy, and now it's classified as an autocracy. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, exactly. I was making sure that when the when the data was conducted, if it was prior to them being... Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I do have to mention that the pandan data is from last year. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. the second part of the presentation doesn't take that into account yet. But, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll update the data soon and then, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, yeah it will be updated. But the VDEM is very updated and up to par, and it was also very scary to see the, the amount of autocracies that we do not speak about that kind of take the back burner in favor of democracies that are already established and developing. Yeah, absolutely. And just a question about the topic that you were talking about uh, that maybe doesn't have with the topic about, around the lecture, but... Uh, uh, it is about the question brought up. Uh, the definition of democracy, uh, how can it affect like power structures and relations of different states? Uh, I mean that India was seen as democ democracy and now it's not. Uh, obviously the power relationship and the power position India has in the global uh, world has now changed. How, it, how did it affect in like the control over what laws, what 
violations India does or not in the global aspect. Uh, yes, so um, India basically that is based on the liberal democracy index, uh, as I showed you uh, as a short answer. And uh, we did do a, a long coverage of India in our democracy report. So you're very welcome uh, to check that out. Uh, but overall, the definition of democracy is based on Dal's concept of polyarchy uh, as electoral democracy. So this includes things like free and fair elections, but also freedoms that make elections meaningful, such as freedom of the media, freedom of association, um, universal suffrage and so on. So um, just, uh, yeah, I would refer you to the democracy report to read more on in India because it is indeed a very important case and I wouldn't want to make uh, just some general comments. Definitely, thank you for the tips. Yes, I can perhaps try it in the chat. <laughs> yes, yes, I would like that. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, then perhaps we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, and thank you so much for hosting this meeting today. It was very nice and very interesting. So, and thank you all for, for coming and for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm.